Okay, well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whoever you are, wherever you are. This is Dr. Patrick Lockwood coming back to you, again, not live, um, in a pre-recorded video or audio about my family addiction and recovery series. And today, as you're listening, I'll be completing the third episode talking about boundaries and triangles and why both concepts are important when you are trying to be supportive of your loved one who struggles with addiction and substance use disorders. Um, Before I get into that, just a quick note about, you know, the uh, coronavirus, 19 novel coronavirus. Um, It's a sad and scary time that we're all part of now. And, you know, I think it's It's very tempting to get caught up in fear-based games and panic buying and blaming and things of that nature. And to the best of our ability, I think it's it's going to be a a real tough time for the next year or so from based based on what I'm reading. Um, But I think we can handle it, and I think that you know we have overcome so much in the last you know. 20 years in terms of technology breakthroughs and uh, medical breakthroughs that I think we can we can share a little bit of optimism in this moment. It's hard for me to be optimistic because I'm normally very skeptical at minimum and pessimistic at worst. And it seems like a lot of people are going to be hurt and sick and who knows, maybe even I'll be one of them. Um, and, you know, if that's the case, it's been a good one. Thanks. Hopefully not. We'll see what happens. Uh, but I think that we have the the shared values and the shared faith in humanity to make this work. And I certainly hope that you know everyone does their part to help limit the spread of the infection and follows guidelines as they're disseminated and just does everything we can to you know take care of each other in this very challenging time because. Um, It's so easy to slip back into nastiness and vitriol whenever we're reasonably self-assured that everything is okay, and I don't think that serves us right now. And I think that we can use this crisis as a a launch pad for a more thoughtful and respectful way of dealing with each other, hopefully, Um, because it's what we deserve at the end of the day. Not that we're not primitive. You've heard me talk at length in a number of videos about how primitive we really are. And if you follow me on Twitter, you see that I say that pretty often. So notwithstanding that, I still think that we have a basic capacity to cooperate and be there for each other. So I hope you do that. I hope that you know you do that to the best of your ability, and I will do the same. Um, so moving right along. This third video, you know, even though we have the virus... People still struggle with mental health conditions. They still struggle with addiction, medical conditions, other than the virus. So I'm going to do my part here to give you my best understanding of how to deal with boundaries and triangles when you are a family member, a spouse, a romantic partner, a sibling, a close friend, etc. of a loved one who has an addiction disorder. And in this video, I want to give you, the family members and the loved ones, some very simple, practical ideas to think about and possibly apply so that you can start developing better boundaries with your loved one who's struggling with addiction. The premise here is pretty simple. When it comes to family systems perspectives on addiction, there are behaviors that we do as loved ones. Notice I said we because I'm no better as a clinician. If I'm not paying attention, I can do these very same things. So there are these behaviors that we do from a systems perspective that generally enables a person who's using drugs to continue their behavior. And in the opposite direction, there are things that we can do to help decrease the behavior indirectly and directly indirectly through better boundaries and directly through more, let's say, um, you know, straightforward statements about what your fears are, your concerns are, and your hopes are. Um, And as I referenced in the first two videos, the first one being just an overview of the concepts and terms and my goals, and the second video being my best short explanation of the etiology of addiction, how it comes about. 
Um, I've tried to give you um, some terms to use, some concepts to think about when thinking of people with addiction. And the one that I've given you to the best of my ability is the magician archetype. And I mean this in the, in the least pathologizing way possible. Um, it's, it's often, you know, the magician archetype is often mischaracterized as a self or manipulating bad guy. And that's not what I mean here at all. What I mean is that, and much you see these different interpretations online of magician, um, I mean someone who's thoughtful and inventive, often what we might call mystical. Um, these are people who, generally speaking, are good at helping you misbelieve for a greater good or a greater good for themselves, something that we might call misdirection when we talk about actual magicians. And I propose that, um, you know, people with addiction disorders act in similar kinds of ways. Again, not to pathologize, just to give a framework so you can be looking out for the right things. You know, magicians use tricks to achieve, hopefully, positive, you know, awe-inspiring, joy, humor, fun, or negative outcomes. And part of helping your loved ones, I would argue, to change their maladaptive behaviors is to change your boundaries so that their tricks that are associated with negative outcomes, lying to keep using, manipulating, etc., are less effective and less powerful. There was this great series a long time ago, and by long time ago, I mean the eight and the 90s, excuse me, Whew, almost went too far. Uh, in the 1990s, there was this great, I think, television show called um, Breaking the Magician's Code, Magic's Biggest Secrets Finally Revealed. And uh, it was hosted by one of the actors from the X-Files, I forget his name. But anyways, I loved it. It was a magician named Valentino who basically gave away some of Magic's biggest tricks, like how to make a tank disappear and uh, how to escape from a hanging, uh, fiery straitjacket and stuff like that that just seemed so fantastical. And for a while, people hated this guy as he was releasing more and more of these episodes. And in the last episode, you know, the masked magician takes off his mask. He was masked the entire series, and then finally he takes it off. And he says, this is why I chose to do this show. And basically, he said that his hope was that he wouldn't ruin the magic necessarily, uh, because the real magic, if you understand how magicians work, is just in sleight of hand and how good they are at deceiving you. That's the real magic. It's the illusion. It's the timing. It's, it's all the razzle-dazzle. That's what we like that gets us into a state of disbelief. It's, the, it's the, the craft. It's the art of doing magic that's so amazing. Not the And, you know, some tricks are very, very complex in timing and number of people involved. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a very fascinating art form. And he, he gave it away, according to his report on the show, because he kind of was tired of these old tricks and many people are getting tired of them. So his hope was that basically people could geek, get in on the show and then that would force magicians to create newer and better tricks. And, you know, the nice thing about real life as opposed to some stage show on FX is there's, there's an upper limit to the resources and creativity that a person that we might call a drug addict um, has in order to maintain their drug use habits. And the great thing is we can influence that upper limit of resources and skills by setting better boundaries. So that's why I wanted to create this video about boundaries. I hope that makes hope that makes sense. So the, the boundaries and the triangles video here is only about helping limit the top end of their tricks and resources to maintain their maladaptive habit. So what are boundaries, right? I've used that word a number of times. You probably have heard about it if you watch shows like Intervention, which I've never seen, or you know other shows like that, therapy shows. And I'm going to pull some you know psychotherapy-based terms out on you, and you can do with them what you wish. So uh, this article by Bonovitz and colleagues discussed boundaries as a psychological, biological, and culturally specific means of protecting and reifying the self. And so said more simply, um, a boundary is a biopsychosocial, a behavior, a thought, and a, a culturally specific way of differentiating you 
from the person across from you, from protecting you from the person across from you. So whatever separates you from the person across from you is a boundary in this psychotherapy sense. So another way I explain this to family members is any boundary, any interpersonal boundary, is any overtly negotiated, though sometimes implicitly assumed, rule of engaging with the world so that we maintain some basic homeostasis, some basic sense of regular flow and functioning in our relationships. Another way of thinking about boundaries are rules of discourse and talk, rules of physical proximity, rules of content and what we discuss, and many more kinds of things. So boundaries are these sometimes overtly, hopefully now after this video, more often overtly, outwardly discussed, ideas, concepts, and rules based upon our, our biological needs, our psychological needs, and our cultural needs to maintain a sense of self and to maintain a sense of well-being. Another definition that I found from uh, Lampinen and colleagues is um, something like, for people to achieve contextually desirable degrees of social interaction and to build and sustain their relations with others and with the self. That's what a boundary is. It's a mechanism for people to achieve contextually, so like situationally, desirable degrees of social interaction and to build and sustain their relations with others and the self. So it's rules for interacting, rules for self-protection, rules for self-understanding, and delineating you from me, separating you from me. And all these um, articles will be cited, and you'll have access to them. So there's, you know, 100 years or more of therapy literature that exists. Uh, even, you know, different psychoanalysts back in the Freud's time talked about boundaries. So I'm not going to sit here and do a literature review of every therapy article ever written on boundaries because that would take hours and hours and it wouldn't do you any good. Um, but if you just generally skim through the literature on boundaries in psychotherapy, uh, what you'll see is many articles related to teaching, nursing, and also therapy. And basically, what we overall find is that when two or more people in a social circumstance do not agree, either implicitly or explicitly, on their boundaries, more conflict ensues, more generalized anxiety shows up, because we basically are alerted through either negative emotional states in the other person, conflict, etc., that something's not right. So we start to worry about the other person and our behavior with them. I even found one article that shows that generalized anxiety disorder is more correlated with what they described as poor boundaries, so not overtly negotiated, etc. And if you look at most, you know, family assessments, so if you go to, like, one of the books I'm using for my assessment class right now with MFTs is by Lynn Sperry, who's a family therapist who's pretty well known, and it's, it talks all about boundaries, and there are different measures to assess different facets of interpersonal boundaries. And it's typically, in the family systems world, related to concepts like individuation and differentiation and things of that nature. And I'm not going to go into that because, again, it doesn't serve you. You don't need technical terms to be more functional in your relationships with your loved ones who struggle with addiction. Um, and another example of how boundaries are so important, and I would even say ubiquitous, is if you look at you know the American Psychological Association or other professional clinical associations, many of the ethics codes in the APA, the CPA, uh, the Board of Psychology, Anything, any clinician's board, whether it's master's level or doctorate level, um, has a number of ethics codes that are all about dual relationships, interpersonal boundaries, etc. And and even some you know pretty straightforward therapy research shows that the better therapists are at managing their interpersonal boundaries with patients, it actually emboldens their ability to take care of themselves. So it's part of their self care. Um, so basically, we all know that boundaries are important. It, they're important in education, in nursing, in therapy, in medicine, everywhere. And most of us have this more or less intuitive sense of what boundaries are. And 
so far. I've added a couple of slightly more textbook or formal definitions so you can kind of have the the working parts in your mind when you think about boundaries with your loved ones struggling with addiction. And again, just as a quick recap, most boundaries in most technical you know, psychotherapy or nursing or education literature is focused mostly on concepts and rules to differentiate you from the other person. What's your responsibility? What's not your responsibility? And then the other part of it is, you know, straightforward rules about talk and physical space and, you know, cultural values and things like that. So, How do these apply to addiction? Let's think about this for a second. If you read articles by mainstream, you know, addiction treatment providers, um, you'll see that different theorists conceptualize boundaries with addiction differently based upon their theoretical orientation. So there's the dynamic people, the behavioral people, the existential people. They all have their own way of conceptualizing boundaries. I found this, um, I would say, useful book chapter by Wiegman and Cohen. And they say that, or they can they conceptualize that boundaries um, are kind of chaotic with addicts, people that we would call drug addicts. Because people who struggle with addiction struggle with a strong degree of internal chaos related to cravings, withdrawals, relational instability, and sense of self instability. So they're very overly reliant, what we might call codependent, which I'll talk about in a few weeks, um, on the most enabling or reliable people in their world. So just to summarize that, these authors theorize that the internal stability, the lack of a sense of self because they chaos of ups and downs of tolerance and withdrawal, detoxification, etc., uh, cravings, mood swings due to the neuroscience of addiction that I talked about last time. Um, these people feel so internally chaotic and out of control, even though their entire sense of self and their relational ideals have started to shift towards the substance and the state of intoxication, the relationship to intoxication that I talked about last time. Um, They now desperately need real-life people who are even more stable than you can imagine. In fact, most of the family members I've worked with come in one of two flavors, uh, broadly speaking. Obviously, there are lots of shades of gray and nuances, but we have the family who's disconnected, which is a certain kind of stability. And then we have the kind of family members who are so involved in enabling, and they're supermen. They, They have capes on, and they're trying to rescue their loved one, and that definitely has a serious burnout effect on the family members who are so perfectly reliable and so good at at shifting and changing and accommodating and rescuing and dealing with every crisis and every overdose and things of that nature, that they're so reliable that you would never think that the person um, could handle their drug use, their emotional states, or their needs on their own in any way, shape, or form. Obviously, that's the extreme kind of end of the third standard deviation above tail and case, but it does exist. And the famous TV example uh, of this, the prototypical one that that I think of a lot, um, is this show called House MD from Fox. Uh, It was about a physician who is some brilliant specialist or whatever, and his friend, another doctor, an oncologist named Wilson, was the codependent, enabling, perfectly reliable, rescued him, got him out of jail, helped him with detox, etc. person. And this house guy was just very, very, you know, chaotic and rude and narcissistic and aggressive and overdosing, all sorts of stuff that was very chaotic and dramatic. Um... And it's a great example of how that relationship can work. It's a good picture of the internal chaos and instability of the person and the giant dramatic relief when the immediate crisis related to the addiction is gone. And that's probably the thing that the show gets best about addiction is it gets the idea of This ongoing continuing crisis or set of small crises related to House's addiction to opioids never changes. It's always in the back of people's minds. Everyone's always dealing with his drug habit. 
Everyone's always wondering if he's high, even though they think he's a genius. And they're always challenging him. And their challenging never works because they keep treating him as if he's okay. He's functioning, right? Functioning. And it's a very complex pain case, da 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 But again, fascinating example, worth of the watch. I don't know how solid the medical side is, but the addiction example is spot on. Um, so let's talk about some common boundary issues. Other than the broad example I just gave you, let's talk about some common boundary issues that will show up with your loved one that you're probably already experiencing, but you might not have had words for, or you know, maybe this is just kind of a no-duh, so just stick with me. Uh, if we go back to my earlier videos that describe addiction as a disease of relationships in the archetype of the magician, we can kind of reverse engineer optimal boundaries with these people depending upon which prototypical behavior you're experiencing with your loved one. And the research is pretty clear in the family systems therapy literature uh, related to addiction that most family members struggle with trust, intimacy, and forgiveness. Those are the three kind of big issues that show up. So how do we reverse engineer behaviors that will either damage trust, damage intimacy, or make it hard to forgive? Well, Obviously, the easiest kind of magician's tricks that damage trust are lies and failed promises. I'll stop this time. I'll use just one more time. I can control it this time. Things of that nature are said. And these are the kinds of things that damage trust. Things that damage intimacy. Well, think logically. What naturally damages intimacy? What naturally damages intimacy, whether it's a sexual relationship or a family relationship, etc.? Typically, friendship, what have you, um, typically our intimacy is based on shared values, shared beliefs, and shared goals and expectations. And when people struggling with addiction violate our values, our beliefs, and our expectations, we tend to not want to be so close to them because we've been burned by them. Not because they're inherently bad people, but because of this particular disease, they now are engaging in the world and with you in ways that you can't fathom. I have this value with you that we both agreed upon prior to your drug issue that we were both going to be open with each other about what we're struggling with. But as the person begins to struggle with addiction more and more, they isolate more and more and do more of the magician's act to say everything is okay. Well, that hurts me because I want to know what's going on with you so I can be there for you. But because you're protecting your relationship to intoxication and your disease, you're no longer vulnerable and intimate with me. You're, you're holding back from me to keep using. Another way that this shows up is, you know, people have expectations about how they'll act, right? People, when they start to struggle more and more and more with addiction, they start to become more inconsistent, more unreliable, and more inconsiderate, not because they're bad people. This is not to further the stereotype that drug addicts are just terrible, nasty jerks. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's people who struggle with addiction tend to engage in manipulative aggressive, unstable, unreliable things because their brain is in a state of pretty constant turmoil of if you don't have constant access to your drugs, you're going through withdrawal pretty consistently. And you can ask anyone who's gone through withdrawal from most substances, it's not fun. At the low end, irritability, anxiety. At the higher end, paranoia, vomiting, sweating, n nausea, just all sorts of horrific things that you wouldn't only experience unless you had the coronavirus or a flu, etc., etc., um, so these people are desperately afraid to not go through that. I think any reasonable person who's experiencing that or knows they're going to experience that would be unreliable, irritable, chaotic, nasty. When you already have this pre-existing social contract that says, we'll be close to each other, we'll cooperate, we'll be nice with each other, that's no longer there. Intimacy is no longer there because their intimacy has shifted to the relationship to intoxication. I find parents that are baffled all the time. How can they treat me so poorly? I find romantic partners in the same. How can they treat me so poorly? Everything was so good before they started using. They don't quite get how this places a, such a substantially higher value on the relationship to intoxication. And the same thing with forgiveness. So again, it's hard to forgive if people keep telling you, I'm going to be 
clean this time. I'm going to stop this time. I'm going to use just a little bit. I'm going to smoke only weed. I'm never going to use heroin again. I'm never going to use Xanax again. I'm never going to drink again. I'm just going to do the, the cannabis maintenance program. And I'm, I'm not sitting here bad, uh, bad-mouthing cannabis. I think it's perfectly fine. But I don't think that most people who would struggle with what we call addiction can be using it recreationally. or And it might be a bit of a challenge to use it to cope with mental health conditions. And I think if you were to debate people like Dr. Mike Hart or Dr. Peter Grinspoon about it, it might get kind of heated. But I, I think as of right now, my experience is that, you know, the cannabis maintenance plan doesn't work for most people who are still in active using mode. So it, it's a it's a tricky thing because of how cannabis works on your dopamine system and your opiate system uh, indirectly through the CB1 receptors and the GABA receptors. Um so those are the three common issues, trust, intimacy, and forgiveness. And I just reverse engineered what that might look like and why people might struggle it. And another common boundary issue or another common interpersonal issue is homeostasis. So if you remember me talking about this in the first and second video, uh, homeostasis is just our normal operating flow. So we have a certain number of good gut bacteria, etc., flora and fauna, blah, 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 blah. That's our gut homeostasis. We're used to a certain amount of water in our body. That's our water-based homeostasis, which is assessed by our kidneys and other things like that. So there's all these different components to our, our physical health homeostasis. Water, oxygen, calcium, glucose, all this stuff. All It's very, very important. And... So goes it the same way with our relationships. Everyone from parents to siblings struggles with the idea that there was this homeostasis I had with my brother or my son or my daughter or my wife or my girlfriend or whoever it is, right? And it changed and it slowly changed. I didn't see it changing. It just kind of slowly shifted to something new where I became more and more concerned or fearful or more and more enabling or more and more distant and distrustful. And then they struggle when they get into family therapy because they don't know how to get back to their previous homeostasis. So we had an original homeostasis and then this period of allostasis where things are shifting because there's an infection. There's a, You could call it an addiction infection, not to be dramatic. Um, and then there's this new homeostasis that develops with the, with the pathogen, the ad addiction pathogen, to use this metaphor, inside of you. And that's, that's your new homeostasis in the, in the sick family system. And then in family therapy, we get to develop a brand new homeostasis. And this is what's so tricky for people because they have homeostasis number one, then the period of allostasis, which is terrible and sad and scary and confusing, and then the new homeostasis with a person who's actively struggling with addiction, etc. And then we have this, hopefully, if the ther family therapy is done correct, you have this new version of homeostasis, a third version that develops where... You develop new boundaries, you develop a new sense of intimacy, you develop a new sense of trust and how to trust, you develop a new sense of forgiveness and how to forgive, and you develop some new dynamics about how the relationship ebbs and flows based upon you know, trust, intimacy, and forgiveness and progress along certain mutually agreed upon areas. One simple example of that is, you know, your two parents and your your young adult child is struggling with addiction, but they're still living with you and you're supporting them, you know, part of your family rebuilding process and trust rebuilding and new dynamic is going to be them showing you behaviorally, because words don't matter too much to me, behaviorally, that they're really doing everything they can. And to the best of their ability, when they can't articulate it, phenomenal, right? They're doing their best behaviorally to engage in a new lifestyle that promotes wellness, not addiction. And when I get to next week's video, or hopefully next week, and with the, you know, the virus outbreak, I guess I can knock it out next week. Um, but when I get to the next video on Wegscheider Cruz's uh, family roles, I'll speak about specific dynamics that need to shift for each family role in order to develop the optimal homeostasis in recovery from addiction. So some people use wellness, some people use recovery. I tend to stick with the word wellness because it has less of a 12-step-y a feel because some people are turned off by the 12 steps. And then, you know, overall the goal when it comes to boundaries is just reshaping the boundaries with your loved one who's struggling with addiction 
into increased engagement with their treatment, increasing their behavioral and emotional involvement in their relationships, and very realistic limit setting. And I'm going to say that again. So your basic goals for reshaping boundaries when you're trying to help someone who's trying to uh, recover from addiction or get into a lifestyle of wellness are helping them to be engaged in treatment because they'll need treatment. Uh, The second thing is helping them um, become more behaviorally and emotionally involved in the relationship. So they're dislodging the relationship to intoxication, and then they're re-engaging in a relationship with real people. And then finally, realistic monitoring, not worrying, and limit setting that is reasonable. Not pathologizing, not warden of a prison, very straightforward. And these are concepts that are highly supported by the multidimensional family therapy literature, just so you're aware. And I'll, I'll show you all my references in the, in the caption. And in terms of tricks to make this happen, tools that you can use, which are the antithesis of the magician's tricks, the first trick that you can use is negotiation. You have leverage. If you're a loved one of someone who's struggling with addiction, whether you're a sibling a parent, an uncle, a grandparent, a partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, what have you, husband, wife, you have leverage. You have emotional leverage. You have financial leverage. You have, and this is not manipulative. This is straight up, straightforward, all cards on the table. This is my leverage. This is what I'm offering to you if you want to be in this relationship with me. And if you don't right now, that's okay. No judgment. I will miss you, I love you, and I'll still support you. I'll always love you. But we have to negotiate, and if you're not willing to negotiate based upon what I bring to the table, that's okay. We can work this out. So that's the first principle is negotiation. The second principle is limit setting. And limit setting is pretty straightforward. And it depends upon what you're willing to give and not give based upon your circumstances, your culture, and many other variables. Uh, But before I talk about limit setting, let me talk about the other two. Uh, Fostering hope is extremely important as a tool, and that's pretty straightforward. I'm not going to elaborate on it. It's not being, you know, delusional and blind. I'm like, no, everything's great. You're going to be fine. That's not fostering hope. Fostering hope is accurately assessing the circumstance by going, okay, what's really going on? How bad is it? Maybe getting a clinician's opinion, etc. And then creating strengths-based positive steps that the person can do in order to change their life or get treatment, etc. That's how you foster hope. Um, And you do your best to take care of yourself. That's how you foster hope. And then readiness to change. Um, Helping them develop readiness to change. So when you're fostering hope and coping better and limit setting, you do your best to negotiate. So let's talk about limit setting. When it comes to limit setting, you have to make a choice about what your bare minimum, your bottom dollar is. So for some people, the non-negotiables are you can't use in my home, You can't use in the apartment with me. If you're going to smoke, if you're going to drink, whatever it is, go do it somewhere else. I can't do it here. You can't do it here. We can't do it here, right? Because I've worked with plenty of people who are using with their partner. Another simple bottom line that people have is, um, you know, if you continue using, you can't live here anymore. Parents do this all the time with their kids. Or if you continue using, I'll no longer financially support you at college. That's a leverage. That's part of negotiations. That bottom line, that limit setting is part of negotiations. These kinds of things. And I'm not recommending any of them specifically because it all is, you know, you can't just take the hardest possible approach and say, kick everyone out, stop, cut everyone off completely, let them be on the street, let them be homeless. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not that guy. What I'm saying is these are the kinds of things that you might recommend depending upon the circumstance. And then everyone's bottom bare minimum is different, right? Some people have no tolerance whatsoever, like the Philippines, and they say, the moment you use, you're out, I'm done, no more. 
And okay, maybe that works for that particular circumstance, but it just depends. So if you're at all concerned about what limits to set and how to do it, pay for one therapy session with a qualified addiction specialist. And 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 if you need help finding one, let me know. Email me, DM me on Twitter. I'll do everything I can to help you find the right professional in your area. Um, because it's very tricky and there's so many nuances and there's so many magic tricks that you might not be seeing, etc. So there's a lot to weigh in there when setting the right limits. But you need to know what your bottom line is at the end of the day regardless. You know, your no-go zone so that your sanity and you're not enabling. So your sanity is intact, sorry, and that you're never enabling. That's what you need to know. Okay, let's talk about triangles. So the other kind of half or so of this is about uh, Murray Bowen's concept of a triangle. But what's a triangle? So a triangle, and I've stolen a lot of this straight from Murray Bowen's website. Um, Bowen was a family systems therapist a while ago and uh, came up with a number of concepts to help us conceptualize problematic boundaries and dynamics in relationships. So a triangle Uh, and I quote, is a three-person relationship system. So just imagine a picture of a triangle. And all three of you, your husband, your wife, and your kid, um, your mom, your dad, and you, etc. This is considered the building block or molecule of larger emotional systems because a triangle is the smallest stable relationship system. A two-person system is unstable because it tolerates little tension before involving a third person. A triangle can contain much more tension without involving another person because the tension can shift around the three relationships, which is true. It's like hot potato. If the tension is too high for one triangle to contain, it spreads to a series of interlocking triangles. Spreading the tension can stabilize the system, but nothing gets resolved. So this is the downside of a triangle. Whereas a two-person, and I'm, I'm taking a break from the, the text from his website. So a two-person system is great in the sense that you have to directly resolve conflict, but there's so much conflict because it's just the two of you all the time, which is why a third person is typically brought in. A child, a spouse, a family member, a friend, whoever is brought into the system to kind of keep some of that tension off of them and and move it to another person. You know, so the classic scenario is you and your romantic partner, your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever are um, in a fight and you immediately go to a shared friend that both of you have and you start talking to them. You gossip and uh, irony of ironies, usually both of you start gossiping to the same person. So now this third person is involved and has to deal with your drama. What do you do? And then that poor third person, who's not really poor in the sense that they are Im- complicit in maintaining your pathological dynamics, right? So, as just a prototypical from a movie, you know, rom- rom-com movie uh, example, that's the kind of thing that happens. And that happens all the time in the addiction world. But I'll, I'll, let me finish this and then I'll come back. Um, so the two-person system is more conflictual but resolves things quicker. The three-person system allows the conflict to be spread out more so that there's less overall conflict, but eventually it's not managed if the two original people with conflict are not dealt with. So that triangle collapses or the energy goes to an overlapping set of triangles. So here's the issue. Though triangles are more stable than a two-person relationship, a two-person relationship is simpler to manage, says Bowen. The other issues include when power dynamics change between two people in a triangle, etc. So then the goal would be to, metaphorically, regain homeostasis or renegotiate homeostasis so that the triangle becomes stable again. In addition, the prototype is the parents triangulated with the sick teen or young adult, where the two are against the teen. That's the power dynamic that supposedly works in South America and North America. Typically, the patient is a conduit, and I want you all to pay attention to this sentence. Typically, the patient is a conduit through which parents' tension or even psychopathology are directed. So the goal is to have the parents stabilize their struggles and not destabilize the branches of the triangle extending to the patient with their chaos. 
he continues, there are dozens of variants and then goes on with an example. So the reason I said pay attention to that sentence because I've worked with families, I've worked with this prototypical family for about 10 years. Mom and dad and either a teenage or young adult child, young adult going up to like 25. So mom and dad and young adult child doesn't mean there aren't other children. It's just this is the triangle I see all the time. So mom and dad have chronic relationship problems. They have chronic tension. They yell and fight too much because there's there's obviously normal yelling and fighting, hopefully less yelling. Um, they engage in passive aggression too much. There's there's a power imbalance between mom and dad that's really unhealthy. There's some kind of problem. One's overly passive, one's overly aggressive, one's overly controlling, one's overly passive, whatever it is. There's a giant power imbalance. And what happens is one of the kids, if not the only child, get pulled into this triangle with the parents. And as a result of the excess conflict at home, not knowing which parent to go to, not knowing which parent to trust, not wanting to be in the middle of their conflict because then you become co-opted and you don't want to be co-opted. I want you to deal with your shit because you're my parents. Leave me out of it. Is the attitude that most teenagers have, middle schoolers have. They expect, because we're simple primates, We expect our caregivers to have their shit together and to basically be able to take care of us. So when they don't, and they don't consistently, we pull away from them. And as we pull away from them, we're no longer able to be, let's say, emotionally regulated by them consistently enough. So now we turn to peers, or maybe we turn to drugs to emotionally regulate ourselves. And then from there, we can develop the relationship to intoxication. And then we distance ourselves more and more. Even if the parents catch up to their bullshit and figure it out, the teen might already be down the path to using drugs and developing that relationship to intoxication or overly focused on peers who are also struggling because they come from similar kinds of homes. Birds of a feather flock together. Sick kids hang out with sick kids. Isolated teens with sick parents hang out with isolated teens with sick parents. Now, just to be perfectly clear, I'm not blaming parents. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm simply saying that this is a scenario I see commonly. There are plenty of parents who are perfectly reasonable people, but because of circumstances or genetics or the kid they just didn't know how to handle, even though they did their best to be reasonable parents despite that, also dozens of scenarios... This is just the one I see the most in treatment because I've worked in kind of the most severe treatment levels, typically speaking. So this is what I see the most commonly. Some parental issues are not well managed. So the teen or young adolescent, not knowing any better, starts to pull away, which is normal. And then they start to redevelop relationships with other people who they think are more stable or are more like them who feel just as disconcerted, disconnected, uncared for, distrustworthy of their parents, untrustworthy. Um, So they develop this relationship with peers, and then eventually they might develop their relationship with intoxication. So it's just one example of a trajectory that gets to addiction for young adults uh, using this Bowenian model. Now, if you're um, the romantic partner of an adult who struggles with addiction, there's probably a parent or there's probably a friend or a boss or something who's also in a triangle with you, either enabling them or trying to stop them. And we can work the triangle thing from about a thousand different angles. This is just the prototypical example I see. So we've talked about triangles. I've given you some examples of how this shows up, something to look for. And we've talked a little about boundaries and limit settings. So let me just leave you with some general, let's say, recommendations so I don't ramble too much, and you can go about your day. General recommendation number one. I want you to do your best if you are struggling with a loved one who struggles with addiction. Do your best to learn their particular magic tricks. You can kind of um, kind of put your lab coat on, get your clipboard out like a scientist, and just observe And just see when things add up and when when they don't add up. When their story makes sense and their story doesn't make sense. When their eyes, their pupils look like they shouldn't look, right? If they're pinned, if they're very, very small, the size of a pin. Or if they're giant, as in the case of like stimulants, etc. 
and they shouldn't. Things like that. When they slur their words when they shouldn't. And I'm not trying to make you more anxious. Just trying to, you know, you can do a little detective work, but don't don't get too far down the rabbit hole. But try to learn their tricks. You know, most of us are not great at lying. We think we are. Most of us also think we're great at telling when someone's lying, and we're also not. I did a video on that. You can check out lies. Um, so... Again, I'm not trying to pathologize anyone. I'm not trying to encourage you to be this worry wart of a person who's looking after this deceptive, nasty, evil magician. That's that's not what I'm, I'm... There's no pathologizing here. These are just heuristics that might make it easier to think about what's going on. And the best part is, if we're not deceived, if we do our best to figure out what tricks they use, then we can't enable them. And people struggling with addiction often aren't trying to, you know, consciously hurt you or deceive you. Most of my patients don't think that they intentionally try to do anything bad. And that's true. I believe that 100%. Because it's no differently than you would sacrifice for your romantic partner, etc., or your child. And you would rationalize to the best of your ability because that's what you're programmed to do. Um, so it's perfectly understandable that a person struggling with addiction would do their best to avoid conflict and lie, manipulate, steal, cheat, avoid, um, rationalize, minimize, justify, things of that nature. Um, it would be perfectly easy for them to do that, and it'd be well within their kind of evolutionary rights. So learn the tricks to the best of your ability. And if you need help identifying them, there are tons of blogs with character defects, to use the 12-step word. There are tons of websites with those things. You can find them. You can DM me. You can find a, a, a qualified licensed clinician in your area if you like. Number two, once you know their tricks, it is now your responsibility to, without their awareness... You don't have to negotiate with them. You can just start shifting your boundaries in a way that limits the effectiveness of the, the tricks that they use. So an example, let's say your partner lives with you and they have friends who also struggle with addiction too. So you and your partner who struggles with addiction and their friends who also struggle. Let's say your partner is really good about lying about what friends they're hanging out with that day. No, no, I'm not hanging out with those. I'm not going to go hang out with my drinking buddies. I'm going to go hang out with, you know, my friends from work. And you can do some simple limit setting that um, it's not deceptive. It's not you doing a magic trick, but just simple accountability limit setting that allows you to help limit the effectiveness of their lies. So you can ask them to be transparent about where they're at, you know, um, you can have them be accountable for when they get home. Uh, you know, make sure you're home by nine. You know, I want to hang out with you. I want to spend some quality time with you. Stuff like that. And if they consistently keep missing because the, you know, there really is an addiction problem, their substance use will be enough to cause an inability to hang out. Or if they come home, they'll be obviously intoxicated in some way, shape, or form. Also, if you really do suspect that your loved one is struggling with some kind of substance use problem, you can look up online the different symptoms of intoxication for different substances. Most addiction treatment websites have different, like DSM-5 um, criteria for intoxication and withdrawal from different substances. And it's, you know, readily available on, like, verywellmind.com, etc. So, if you want to find, if you want to do your best to figure out which tricks they're using, see what kind of symptoms they might show up with. So if you suspect they have an alcohol problem or an opiate problem because their eyes are always pinned and they're always calm, but then they're all of a sudden irritable or they have a stimulant problem or whatever you think they have, whatever issue you think there is, see if you can do a little homework on what the signs of intoxication and withdrawal are because then you can learn what magic tricks they might be using, right? Now, obviously, if you do the, the friend-limiting behavior, that's not going to stop them from using. It's just going to progress the game along so that eventually they have to start giving away their hand more. That's all that's designed to do. Now, if you're actively in treatment with your loved one, 
you can set very clear, openly negotiated limits. Like if you come home from treatment, you're not allowed to use here. Um, after your first relapse, you have to go back to treatment or something of that nature, right? You can, you can do that. And you have to be perfectly clear about what boundaries you want. Therefore, they have to comply because you have leverage that you don't think you have because maybe you're fearful. Number three, this is perhaps the simplest, but maybe the most important in some cases. I recommend that you're perfectly clear with your loved one about your desire for their health. And I don't mean create this fear-driven speech about how you're so worried about their health. No, don't do that. Fear is perfectly normal in this case, but it's your job to cope better so that you don't worry at them or fear vomit on them. That is not okay, because if you do that, all you're doing is driving them further underground, and they'll keep using more and more magic tricks. So the, the person who struggles with addiction has this magician's archetype, and then the person who is a loved one of a person with magician, uh, 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 an addiction problem, excuse me, um, has this fear-based let's say, persona that shows up where everything's worry-based, everything's on the lookout for the next sign or symptom, everything is, I don't trust you. And you become like a private investigator for in your with your marriage or with your son or with your wife or whomever it is, right? And that's not what you signed up for. You can't do that. That doesn't work. Um, you cannot fear vomit on someone when you're trying to express your concerns for the health. Just be perfectly clear that I love you very much, and I hope that you take your health very seriously, and I want to support you in living a healthier life. I'll go to the gym with you. I'll go on a walk with you. I'll go to AA meetings with you. I'll go to therapy, family therapy with you. I'll go to Al-Anon. I'll, whatever it is that I can do to be supportive of you, I'll do it. But your health is what matters most to me, and you engaging in this drug use behavior concerns me about your health. It's that simple. And it can't work. It can't last. Number four. Once they're in treatment, once your loved one is in treatment, you need to be perfectly clear throughout their treatment or their intervention, whatever it is. When you're negotiating, you need to negotiate perfectly clearly one of two options with them in accordance with whatever the professional you're working with says. Either abstinence or harm reduction. Either of those two approaches is perfectly fine. They both have good evidence. Make sure you do your best to state your preference without attempting to manipulate them or negotiate or pause the re If you just do good in treatment for three months, I'll give you a car. I heard that from a parent once, and I was like, that's, that's going to work terribly. It, you cannot positively reinforce someone for playing a game. That doesn't work. Don't do that ever. It does not work. I solidly can say the whole, if you complete treatment, I'll give you a reward, does not work. So all you can do is say, okay, let's do the abstinence thing. Let's work on it. Let's set some boundaries and some rules, some, some goals, and we'll work on it. Or harm reduction. Okay, so we're going to do medication-assisted therapy for opioid use disorder, Suboxone, whatever it is. What can we do to make this happen? How do I work with a, a licensed physician, a therapist, and family therapist, etc., to make this work? And be perfectly clear whether or not you're okay with harm reduction or whether or not you're okay with abstinence. And do your research on what those two things are. And if you need help, I'll help. If you need to speak to a clinician, I'm happy to guide you to someone in the area that you live. But do your best to know what you're what you're hoping for. Is your goal complete abstinence, not using anything at all? Or is it harm reduction? If you try to manipulate, if you try to wheel and deal, that doesn't work. It only worsens the behavior. Number five, be upfront about your bottom line, as I already said. Number six, money, supporting, etc., the using or magician lifestyle. You need to have very clear boundaries for yourself about what types of support you're willing to engage in for someone who's either, you know, pre-contemplation, 
not thinking about changing at all in the next six months, or contemplation, thinking about changing but not quite sure when or how, and preparation, which is in the next 30 days I think I'll do something, uh, or action, they're actively involved in calling treatment centers and getting enrolled and stuff like that. Whatever phase of change they're in, or the ones I just listed, know what types of support you're willing to give. Is it just rides to therapy? Is it just paying for therapy or treatment or MAT? Is it just rides to AA meetings? Is it a place to stay and nothing else? Like, what is it? Be, be perfectly clear about what you're willing to support and consult, consult, consult. Talk to other family members. Talk to people in Al-Anon meetings. Talk to people if, if the treatment center you are sending your, your loved one to has a family support group, go to it. Get the advice of the experts. I used to run one. I know exactly how this plays out. Number seven, if and only if you find yourself in some kind of unstable or chaotic triangle where there's always constant conflict between the three of you, etc., your job is to get out slowly and methodically. Obviously, if it's a life-threatening behavior, the person's overdosing or whatever, then you want to call 911 make sure they're okay. Seek out professional help right away. But if it's just there's constant conflict, constant arguing, etc., do your best to back out. Maybe that means going to therapy. Maybe that means, you know, asking the person who's in a state of high conflict to leave, whatever it is. Um, I'll give you a quick example from a session of mine. Um, a young man once said to his parents, I'm tired of your divorce coming up in family therapy. Deal with it between you two. Because he was in treatment to deal with his addiction problem. His two parents in separate sessions would always bring up the other person and badmouth each other because they were going through divorce and all sorts of stuff. This is exactly what destroys family therapy. When their conflict is not resolved on the outside, it comes into that person's addiction family therapy. It needs to be addressed. So if you're part of a chaotic or unstable triangle, back away from it. Back away from it. Just back away. It's not a white flag. It's none of that stuff. Just back away. Tone it down. Resolve the conflict. Cope better. And then engage in the family therapy. So overall, your job is to be 100% clear on your boundaries across different relationship or life dynamics. Your job is to reevaluate as necessary your boundaries, your limits, your intimacy needs, etc. Your job is to cope the best that you can. If you're experiencing a lot of fear because your loved one is struggling, go to meetings, go to family support groups. DM me something, do something to, to deal to cope better. Something will get better. And Please seek out as much professional support as you can afford because it's worth it. If it feels messy, if you feel like you're lost in a game that you can't predict and you can't control even though you think you understand it, seek out support. So I appreciate you all listening. I hope this has been helpful and has made sense. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll have the next episode out as much as I can about the family roles in addiction. I really appreciate you listening, and I hope you're all well amidst this coronavirus circumstance. Um, If there's anything I can do, I'm readily accessible through email or through Twitter. Please feel free to contact me. I may not have much to offer, but I'll do the best I can to be supportive in your circumstances. Have a good day, and uh, I'll see you fairly soon.